Hey everybody and welcome to a new episode for the Drag and Drop Show by Creatopy. I'm Robert Katai, Marketing and Communication Manager here at Creatopy and I have with me today the one and only Chris Doe. So I believe that Chris doesn't need any presentation, but if you are living under a rock, let me tell you this, Chris is the voice of the designer in the business world and and this is somehow my personal opinion. He's the one who is building the bridge to become a better today in what you will do in tomorrow. So uh, this is my own personal, personal perspective. But Chris wrote an exciting tweet a while ago about AI and design. And it went something like this. I will read it right now. AI is not a replacement for artists, craftsmanships, design thinking and heart. AI will replace boring generic stock art. It could bring new buyers of art once they see how much richer their message campaign is. Professional, commercial work requires greater precision and nuance. And it generates hundreds of, uh, of retweets, hundreds of thousands of views and a lot of engagement. So Chris, my first question about this tweet is, how do you think AI can or should enhance artistic creativity rather than replace it entirely? I think AI is like many different things before it, a tool. And if we just look at the history as to what tools promise for creative people, we can see both sides of the equation, the fear-based thinking and also the opportunity-based thinking. So let's first address that part. Let's just look into our recent past. Uh, I don't know if you're old enough to remember a time when typesetting was done by photo typesetting. They had big machines and then you would send text into someone and they were professionally trained to set your type. So it's called typesetting. They would set the type. And then desktop publishing comes along and there's such things as fonts and typefaces and page layout programs that was going to displace this entire industry. I think a lot of traditional graphic designers at that time are probably experiencing some sort of scale of what we're fearing facing right now with AI in that new tools tend to replace and displace certain types of people and you have a choice. So if we're sitting here and you and I are talking, almost everybody that's listening to this had made that decision already because they were not personally impacted by typesetting. They wanted to use the tools to manifest their ideas or thinking to empower them to create in ways that they could not before. This was an exciting time because in the late 80s, early 90s, desktop publishing was becoming a thing. And I was so excited by it, still very new, in that a normal person such as myself who might not have the drafting skills or the access to all this expensive equipment can make things. Now, this pissed off a lot of people because now you're giving tools to amateurs, people who are untrained in design and art. And they made a lot of bad things. And slowly but surely, the Phototype Center went away and desktop publishing becomes the standard de facto way that you make design. Does it, this sound awfully familiar to everybody? Yet we failed to learn from history and we're just freaking out, saying that AI is going to replace designers and creatives and artists. In a way it might, but I wanna talk about that. I wanna have a real adult conversation versus putting our fingers in our ears and saying, la, 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 this is not gonna happen. Uh, this won't work, this is terrible. And, and try to throw it on a legal aspect to say, well, what is it doing technically? Is it stealing artists against their will? Uh, stealing art from artists against their will? It's not citing their sources. It gets really complicated. I'm not here as a lawyer. I'm, I'm not here as one who's in government and judiciary circles to say like, well, let's debate the legality of it. All I know, like progress and evolution and change, the train moves forward. It just goes one direction. And it's up to you to decide if you want to get on that train or you can get run over by it. So I'm here as a voice for artists and creatives. Let's embrace new tools and technologies. Like you have a digital camera that you're using presumably today. Actually, there's a great one and it fits in your pocket that is far superior to technologies that were available just 20 years ago. Yet, I don't see you sitting around complaining, lamenting why you don't have to load 35 millimeter film into a camera and then to shoot 36 exposures at a time and then drop it off to be processed and then to pay someone just to look at what you took a week, two weeks before, and remember, like, did I set it up correctly? We're not complaining about these things because we can't see it. So we're a very self-centered culture society where we think if it impacts me negatively, it must be bad. 
If it impacts others negatively, it's not my problem. That's called progress. Well, that's a double standard, my friend. And I want to talk about that. I want to be real about it. So these tools can enhance you. Now, I want to set, uh, I want to point to some positive references first. I know some people who, who are neurodivergent. They're on the spectrum, right? They could be autistic. They could be ADHD. I have a friend who's a photographer who's blind in one eye and nearly deaf in the other. And he's using AI technologies to augment what he can't do. And if you're dyslexic or if English is your second language, AI allows you to do things you might not have been able to do before. It gives you an opportunity to compete with everyone and use your neurodivergent brain to do things to make a living. How can I be against that? I don't understand that. Last thing I want to point out is this, is that there are people who are not traditionally trained graphic designers, illustrators, and concept artists. And so they're going to go on mid-journey or chat GPT and they're going to type in some things and they might get pretty good results. And we're upset because we're thinking they took a job away from us. Let me tell you something right now. Those people were never going to hire you. Do you understand this? Business people who want to spend 25 cents on, on a chat-based uh, uh, GPT prompt thing or an AI engine to make images were never going to hire you. So they didn't take your job. That was not a job to be had. Now, there's this middle area where they might have thought about hiring a concept artist, an illustrator to bring the concept to life. Well, let me, let me make this argument. <clears throat> if you played around with any AI-based tools, they're not that precise yet. They always have trouble with fingers and feet and composition, but they get you really close. Here's where I think the real opportunity is. Those people will now say, wow, our presentation, our keynote, our, our book cover illustration is so much better with an image versus what we were going to use. Why don't we hire real artists and use this as a jumping off point and share this with people and say, this gets me close and your style is amazing. Can you do what you do, but take this and run with it? I am literally doing this, Robert. I'm literally doing this. I generated some concepts for posters for my European tour. People are always saying, hey, can we buy these posters? And I feel like, wait, wait, wait. First of all, they're not perfect. <laughs> There's problems with them. Like the, the bicycle wheel is not perfect. I, I, I know, I know. So we're working with a young illustrator to say, like, I don't know who you are, but your style is kind of like this. Can you make all these, make it cohesive and fix all the problems and just put your own spin on it? And we're going to pay this person what they asked for. And so this person has a brand new opportunity from a buyer who never thought, let me make some posters. And, and this is how progress happens. So again, from my soapbox, throw it back over to you, Robert. Yeah. <laughs> So while I was reading all the replies to your tweet, an idea, an idea jumped out right in front of me. So AI, as you already said, is a great way to generate rough ideas and also to iterate your own ideas with speed. So can you tell us how was your first moment when you understood that AI can help you iterate your own ideas? I think you can understand it immediately. All you have to do is look at the work that's being generated by people and you first feel some some negative emotions. I don't know about you. When I first saw Mid Journey Output, I'm like, wait, how are you? What? What? How are you doing this? This is amazing. You, you're using a machine to make this. And so you have fears of missing out. You, you, you get confused. You're curious. You might feel threatened or you might feel really excited. And most people just stop there. They just live in their emotional state. But when you get into mid-journey or stable diffusion and you start messing around with stuff, the first things you get are pretty ugly. I don't know about you. And they're like, wait a minute. I don't think I'm doing it right. I'm like, why is everybody else getting these incredible results and my things look like, but this is terrible. Too many words, too few words. What am I doing? And you go through this whole process and you start to learn. I'll give you a classic example. And this is one where it becomes very clear to me. I, I was thinking about this idea that human beings, and, and you know this, are kind of like sheep. We just follow whatever the mass is telling us to read, to like, to watch, uh, to wear, to live. We, we, we just follow other people. There's only a few things we actually do our own research and think for ourselves, but we're kind of like sheeple. So I wanted to create an illustration to show this. So I was thinking, you know, maybe we're a person in sheep's clothing. Like, you know, the expression expression like a wolf in sheep's clothing. 
And I tried to generate ideas and it just was not getting me anywhere. I was really frustrated. I was thinking, huh, I found the limitations of AI. <laughs> I found it. It's like, you, it can't make what I want, but maybe it was me. And then somehow I started playing around with some of the prompts and I changed the words a little bit and it generated something that was amazing. It was a sheep in a person's clothing and the concept became much clearer, much better. It was even more profound. So if I were in communication design class at you know 19 years old, first semester at Art Center, and we had advertising concepts and we were trying to generate ideas that communicate, if I had MidJourney as my brainstorming partner, could you imagine the kind of ideas that I would be able to come up with using this machine to iterate? And I would spend very little time drawing, sketching, and looking things up so that I would just focus on the idea portion of it until I landed on something that felt communicated it clearly. Mm. How incredible is that? So if you're a creative person, it, whether you write or you draw or make images, build websites, write marketing um, campaigns, build funnels, build websites, AI, either in its written form or its visual form or even coding, can help you do what you do better, faster, and dare I say different. And that's the really cool part. Mm. I was thinking about AI and when I started using and playing, I think that it, at the beginning you play with AI, you play with the chat GPT, you play with me journey and you're just playing and experiencing. And then you have that, that trigger moment when you say, okay, here is something more interesting. And when you want to dive deeper, you will find it that AI, it's not a tool that will replace your job. It can replace if you if you will let them, but if you will uh, use ChatGPT or MidJourney as your brainstorm partner, then you have also the speed, and then you have the, uh, let's say, when you start creating something, you don't start with a blank page. You have that partner that you say, okay, here are some rough ideas, here are some ideas from what we can already iterate on it. So that's why I, when I saw your first visuals and you started doing these visuals from Mid Journey and posting them on LinkedIn and Twitter, and you said that, hey, here's my first cover for a slide deck you've done. I said that that's maybe the first idea I saw how people can use Mid Journey and uh, AI in their art and design. And, and then it stuck me uh, in another way, like what impact might the widespread of U AI, of the use of AI in art and design have on the advertising industry in a whole. And here I believe that we are in a very important moment that AI will start creating a new perspective for design and advertising. How do you see this? I think the uh, the potential to use AI to generate conceptual images that go beyond what you or I can think of is is most definitely there. I think the problem with human beings with our vast ability to imagine things is we get stuck in orders of what we've been told, what can be done, what should be done, what's proper and appropriate. The machine is not burdened with those ideas, those orders where there w could be because we've been conditioned or socialized to think a certain way like oh uh, it, here's a classic example of creativity my son when he was much younger i bought him a toy car you know parents do that there's nothing unusual about that but while he was there like maybe he was a year and a half old i don't know how old he was he's playing with a car and he's trying to climb inside the car and the car's only this big so he's trying to put his foot, which is bigger than the size of the door of the car. So he has no sense of space, mass, and all these rules about what you can and cannot do. And I was marveling at him trying to do this and just smiling, you know, as a dad, just seeing how a person looks at a problem. Well, AI has that same curiosity, I, I suppose. Maybe I'm anthropomorphizing computers, but it can come up with things that you already long said to yourself, that's not possible. I think this is where the real joy comes in. When you start to type in some, some prompts and you keep it kind of loose and open, what the machine comes back, if you're skilled at doing this, surprises you and you're like, I didn't think to do it that way. My example was I was stuck thinking about a person wearing a sheep's clothing. 
I don't know why I didn't think of it, but actually a sheep and a person's clothing is much more interesting. So mm-hmm. it's really telling us about our nature, not what we what we pretend to be. So we're all just sheep pretending to be human and independent thinkers and with free will. And that, that those are kind of those serendipitous accidents, those happy accidents, as Bob Ross would call them, which make for beautiful concepts. I'm seeing conceptual imagery being created by a handful of creators that are kind of fake ad campaigns that are really fascinating to me. A cookie that has teeth, like it bites you back. You know, it's like we don't think of those weird ideas. Now, I remember when I was in design school, there were a handful of individuals who would come up with the craziest ideas. And it's so bizarre. I was like, that's so punk rock. And I often would dismiss them as, you know, I think they've experimented with drugs uh, because obviously they've seen some dark things in their lives. And I'm very square. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I've never done any drugs. I was thinking, man, they have an unfair competitive advantage. They've had (laughs) mind-altering chemicals, right? And they can see trippy things. I don't think it's coincidental. The people who have tripped on acid see the world in a very different way. You notice those paintings by people who have been on acid? They see through the body and the blood veins and the heat and the temperature, and they see colors different uh, because they can see parts of the light spectrum that are not visible to us. And so AI has the potential to augment and enhance our very finite thinking to open doors for us if we want to go down that path. I think that's really cool, Robert. Hmm. So what would you say to someone who is somehow, let's say, scared that AI will replace their work as an artist or designer? I would say if you're an artist, you have nothing to be worried about. I don't think any real artists are saying that deeply. I think they're offended that their art is being sampled and they forget that they're being hypocritical. Um, I talked to a department chair at a prominent design school in New York City. And he said, I've, I've done the research, I've read the debate both sides, and I've come to the conclusion that AI is not doing anything different than what humans and artists have been doing for a very long time. He says it's not stealing. It's, he, he refers to it as deep looking, and it's what we've all done, right? I don't know about you when I was coming up, I was influenced by a handful of graphic designers, David Carson, Neville Brody, uh, Zuana Licko, and the folks over at, um, at Emigre, and, and Charles S. Anderson. And everything I did was trying really hard to copy their work, but not getting that close. That was my frustration. Like, it's like I either can steal it uh, or I can do something that's a poor copy of it and it's not that good. And, and we've been doing this, and we've been doing this for a really long time. And everybody who's ever studied art knows this, that the first step is just to copy, to try to achieve what the masters have done. And writers have done this. They will literally type in the same words from great novels that they admire just to get a feel for what the good words sound like. And so we try and copy things. Like Picasso said, I could draw like the great masters by the time I was eight. Drawing the way I did or I do now took a lifetime to learn. And so it's part of the learning process. And so many people are like, oh, it's stealing. It's like, well, what are you doing? What were, you, what were you literally just looking at on Pinterest or Behance? Were you deep looking? No, you were synthesizing, processing multiple points of influences to solve a specific set of problems. What do you think AI is doing? It's been trained on faces and hands and art styles and lighting techniques So it kind of knows a lot about everything. So it's waiting for a human to give it some guidance as to what it is that you want. Now, the cool thing about all these AI engines is they're becoming much more sophisticated and will require less understanding from your part. And you could just start to say certain things to it and it'll start to know because it's been trained by hundreds of thousands of people simultaneously saying what is good, what is desirable, and what isn't. So I just Mm -hmm. think, We can sit here. It's like the wave, right? A wave is coming. We know this. If you stand there and you stare at the wave and you're scared, the wave will crush you. You might drown. Or you can go grab a surfboard and you can learn to have some fun and enjoy the ride. And I think those are the opportunities. So if you're scared uh, because you're concerned about legal, ethical things, I would say look inside your heart first, inside your mind, and don't be a hypocrite. 
and let the lawyers be lawyers. Artists should be artists, right? So people are like, well, what percentage of this is copyrighted and trademark infringement? I'm like, I don't know. I'm not an attorney. Are you? <laughs> are you a judge? And if you are, go ahead and decide that. If you want to litigate, if you want to do a class action lawsuit, get together with your friends and go do it, put your money there, go for it. But to sit there and pass it off as a legal issue, just like those early typesetters who probably were not that happy with desktop publishing, they could have made the transition, but they didn't. And that's the saddest part. And I don't want to see that happening to a whole generation of creative people. Chris, thank you very much. I believe you opened a lot of mind for designers and artists. And if not, it's their part, it's their situation, if they will accept and embrace AI in their work or not. So Chris, I want to thank you for being on this episode. And I also want to thank you for somehow experiencing new ideas, new waves, waiting the big waves, you can ride in it on them and then just, hey, Let's do that together. Maybe it will work for you or maybe not, but you know, you want to know if you won't try it. So again, I want to thank you. Thank you for being on this episode. And as I already said, I'm honored and thank you very much, Chris. Uh, that was great. Thank you. It was my pleasure. And uh, I hope you and your community will, will jump on AI and use it in ways that we can only imagine today.